Hi. Really? Hello, everybody. All we, right. I think we've got Jennifer on. Yeah. We got Sorry, her. Guys, we were having tech difficulties, but she's here. I'm not sure who. I think I, that's so weird. It let. I'm gonna go. I'm sorry. We're gonna give you two seconds of a, a feedback here. Until we went live, it was not allowed. It would let me on. The as soon as you we went, went live, out, it did. It popped her in. Restream. Not my favorite experience. <laughs> you know, but like so many other things, I think it's it's getting a little bit easier. You know, it'll it'll get easier. I don't know why your email is messed up on it. There's like yes. some dollar sign icon thing or something on yeah, it. it doesn't make weird. any sense. And last week I was trying to get onto the, sh uh, the show from on the road via my phone. And it definitely didn't like that. So I couldn't get on with, um, with a, with a phone at all. Even, I mean, even at home, hear it, in the background, it has to be the literally computer. The windows and walls in my house are shaking. We are having tornado warnings in Chicago right now. Oh, heard. oh joy. It's scary. It's very dark and lots of lightning. That time of year there, huh? Yeah. Hmm. All right. So we had, we did this whole month. This is Jennifer's Jam. Yeah. I don't know why I'm blurry. My baby. So, um, we did, we held down the fort. I think we did pretty well. It Not was interesting. Spectacular, but we kind of, we filled in the gap. So well, we, we were kind of expecting Jennifer last week. Yeah. And like, oh, well, we don't want to cover what Jennifer's going to cover. <laughs> <laughs> well, just so you know, we are trying again with grooming, uh, the history of yeah. grooming. Yes. Of course, I don't know if people know this, but I'm, hey, Mindy. Mindy, um, Mindy. I am, uh, I am a history teacher. I have a master's degree in history. I've taught history for decades and uh i just love history and so when dara said she wanted to do this as a grooming history topic i was so excited we've so never excited. done this so this is the first time we've gone this in depth in this right. um i'm going to take myself out for just a second good and and i'm going to take it away so you go right on yeah so I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the first one of the things that struck me the most interesting, I actually, you know, I'm writing my book on the 15 co-types, but I'm going to be writing, I, I, I promise uh, at some point, I may be much older, but I definitely, before I retire, I'm going to do something in the way of writing a history of grooming because it really, there needs to be an in-depth, there needs to be a book and there really hasn't. There's been a couple of uh, shorter website things and articles and stuff, but this is, I, I want to do, you know, the definitive book. Um, That'd and, be great. You know, being a master groomer and a, um, you know, historian professionally, I think I, I may be the only one in the industry that's a CMG and also a master's in history. So I'm going to take advantage of that. But um, I will tell you that, um, uh, that there was a, a couple of people that have started the project. And I just want to acknowledge them. Terry DiMarino and um, a group of, of her um, cohorts and colleagues, um, generation, generationally especially, have started collecting, you know, what I would call is the modern history of grooming, you know, where the grooming profession that we know today, how, you know, it, you know Jerry Schinberg started the first trade show and how, um, you know, uh, Gwen and, um, you know, uh, how Gwen Shelley and uh, uh, Sally Lytic started Barclay and how, um, you know, the first grooming contests were developed and, and just, you know, who the great, you know, original, you know, like the Nash Academy and so in all of these and Sam Cole and the New York School of Grooming and all of these. So there's a lot of history that's just within the last, you know, 50 50 years, it's very, very interesting. But when I think of history of grooming, you know, when I do my history of dogs stuff, my encyclopedia of dogs program, or I talk about the my human dog coevolution and so on, the history of human beings living with dogs and human beings and dogs caring for each other goes way back, way, way back before we were walking, talking, living in civilization, before we were reading, writing. Um, uh, it goes way back. But grooming, doesn't go as far back as far as I can see physical evidence for. So I have studied, um, you know, millions of years old research that has been dating, uh, the dog has been dated further and further back. 
Um, and actually, they are now dating the dog instead of being tens of thousands of years old, they're dating the dog back, um, you know, in terms of 33 to 50 or 47,000 possible years in terms of the modern domesticated dog. Um, its ancestry obviously goes back millions. Um, and so since we now know the genetics ever since 2003, and they mapped the canine genome, they have been able to identify genetically some actual dog remains that are in primitive, uh, prehistoric uh, human graves. And there is, you know, 12,000 year old graves of women buried with puppies wrapped, cuddled around their heads. And um, you know, all sorts of other archaeological and genetic evidence about the human dog relationship going way, way, way back. So that's a whole nother conversation for another day. But um, in terms of grooming, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of grooming um, with those more early, you know, 10,000 plus year old relationships with dogs. Probably those were natural fur type dogs that shed out on their own and, um, you know, lived naturally um, with people. Um, the first, I actually went back to see in the two great ancient civilizations of the Western world, um, Rome and in Egypt, um, that there are actually, you know, there is much more evidence of, of people and dogs together. Their jewelry art of them, uh, pictures of what their their collared leashes. They had collars and leashes, and they had jewels on the on the collars. There's a lot of uh, evidence of thousands of years old, two thousand years old, three thousand years old stuff, where there is real. There's pictures of dogs. Uh, in art, living in homes and um, and so on. But it looks like the Egyptian stuff, they're all sight hounds with short hair. So again, grooming, I you know, I have not, there's, there's beautiful combs that a woman might have stuck in her hair that has dog art on it. But any evidence that we were doing combs, brushes, scissors, anything like that with dogs, no evidence of that. So I always, as a historian, go by the evidence, okay? The first time I personally have seen evidence of actual grooming is in ancient Rome. Uh, there is a coin dated 111 to 112 BCE, before the Common Era or before the Christian Era. So before Jesus lived, about 110, 111, 112 years old prior to uh, the life of Christ. So that would be more than 2000, you know, I mean, we're in, you know, we're in 2022. So we're at least 2000, you know, 2100 years back ago. Okay. So that's a long time ago is civilization wise, history wise, but there's a, there's a Roman coin that actually shows soldiers standing ceremonially. And in between them is clearly a dog clearly cut with little pom-poms on it. And I show that that coin in my PowerPoint presentations, uh, dated 111 BC. Um, and this clearly what we're calling a proto-poodle or a proto-continental cut, that clearly was a haircut on a dog with poofy balls around the ankles and around um, the elbows, and then a sort of a jacket-like thing, and a little poof on the head, and a little poof on the tail. And that's on a coin. And it's obviously a coin wow. is small, so it's not super detailed. And that but was that, Greek? Roman? Yeah, Roman. It's Roman? ancient Roman. It's 100 years yeah. see in ancient Rome. So um, there doesn't, I haven't seen anything from the Greek civilization with actual physical yeah. evidence of grooming. Okay. So this is, this is my criteria. Have I seen it? And is it, yes, Amber says proto poodle. That's right. Hi, Lisa. And hi, Amber. And hi, Mindy. Um, so it is definitely um, a proto poodle, I'm calling it in my, in my presentations. And the cool thing about it is we also know from archaeological data that Romans had the first, you know, if you actually Google on the internet, uh, history of scissors or, you know, scissors in history or something like that, it will actually tell you, you know, what civilizations had what kind of tools 
how they forged them, whether they hammered them by, you know, they would put metal on a stick in a fire and it'd get hot and they'd hammer it into the shape they wanted. Um, but the Romans perfected the, the, the thing that is the closest to an early scissor. And what it was, it's a U-shaped piece of metal. It's a single piece of metal that has a bendy flat like cup and then flat blades at the top of each of those, it, and it's kind of on a spring. So it would be a single piece of metal with two flat hammered blades and a sharp edge, and you would squeeze it together and it would open and shut and open and shut. And um, so those are sort of uh, what, what you're seeing on the internet historically as being maybe the earliest scissor uh, in, in history. And clearly, as far as I have seen, and maybe there is something from ancient China that I haven't seen or um, something like that, but um, that I, and I've been looking. So I think I'm going to call this the earliest evidence, at least for me, in terms of uh, grooming, that there was clearly in Rome a dog with hair that got cut into little balls that's on a coin that's 22, you know, 2100, 2200 years old, and that. Um, uh, has clear evidence of a haircut. So that's where I think it starts. And from there, um, a couple of other just critical things. And I know, Dara, you and I are both huge fans of this book. Yeah, I love so, that book. Yep. Um, I think Chrissy has it also. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I love this book. I just we found a picture of the coin. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, yeah, you can screenshot find that my, and see if I can book is out of, share that. Um, yeah. I see it but I can't grab it. Yeah, I'm so I haven't been that. able to figure out how to make PowerPoints appear on, PowerPoint slides appear on this restream. Um, um, can, so, ooh, I'm go just ahead. gonna ask really quick, at the bottom of your screen, maybe Christy can help me too. I have the, I can share screen. Um, under settings. Yeah, you guys give it a try. I will carry on. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, with, share screen, um, yeah. So you can next. share your PowerPoint, Jennifer. Oh, um, I don't know that I even have it on this computer right now. Oh, okay. Um, but if you've got a, a picture, I mean, I could even hold up, if it's in this book, yeah, I could hold, hold it, it up to the camera. I was doing that last week too. Where is what? Where is the picture of the Roman coin in the book? Oh, it's in the book? Oh. I don't know. I found I, it online. I'm over oh, here doing it. Share a picture, Chrissy. So that's what I'm yeah. doing. I'm getting yeah. into. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, we'll let Chrissy work on that. So I, <laughs> I want to skip. We've got 2,000 years to get yeah. in here. So I'm going to fly ahead. We got two more weeks. So. <laughs> 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 so where I come in historically, my area of expertise as an undergraduate in my history studies was in medieval European history. And which is the medieval period is the period between the fall of the Roman Empire and the Renaissance. So it's a thousand year period, sometimes called the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages, where um, in uh, there was a sort of a collapse of civilization and a collapse of education and culture because Rome had fallen to the Huns and the Visigoths, the Germanic tribes that attacked the Roman Empire. Um, and it, basically, uh, Europe and Northern Africa were in somewhat of sort of just warring clans and regional, um, there was no defined countries to speak of for a long period of time. There were kingdoms or serfdoms or um, places where noble lords would have a, 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 um, uh, a sort of a village with surrounding people living there. And there's really good evidence of dogs there and dogs being actually groomed. And so um, those, we, we're just gonna call them noble lords. Are you, uh, you, can you guys still hear me okay? Yep. Yep, yep. I felt yep. like I looked there for a second. No, um, it was um, the link for the the picture of the- Oh, um, for the picture. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah okay, yep. Poodle yep. Mojo. I couldn't share the picture, but I could share the link. I'm Very, gonna, good. Very good. I'm gonna copy and paste it and share it right now. Okay, cool. So, uh, yes, because when you see this Roman coin, mm. it's definitely a, a haircut. It's definitely a haircut. So, um, 
fast forward to now the fall of the Roman Empire and we're into the Dark Ages and there's just sort of everybody grabbing their own little piece of real estate and um, not well-defined countries for or, or, you know, just more kingdoms and serfdoms with a noble lord and his little village around him. Um, dogs were very, very valuable. And only the rich people would control them because they were the key to successful hunting and therefore successful meat on your plate. They were farming, and so they had grain and, and you know that kind of diet. But to get meat on their plate, they had to hunt. And uh, they weren't really raising cattle for slaughter or anything like that. Um, there it is. Yes. There it is. Point. Okay. It's uh, and if you yeah. can zoom in, I don't know if you can zoom in on that. Uh, the I'm not sure how to zoom in on my laptop screen, but, um, but, but in that's the where the link brings that. you from, too. Yeah. And people can go in from the link themselves mm -hmm. and see it. Yeah. But um, it is, it's pretty cool. It's very clearly a, a, a sure. you know, a, a, almost like a continental cut. Yeah. And by the way, yeah, yeah, really, really why the history of the continental cut? That actually has a, what's the purpose or function of that? It has a purpose. Mm -hmm. Poodles, as you know, you guys know that anything with hair is going to, when it gets wet, these are water retrievers in many cases. Poodle, the name poodle comes from the German word puddle, puddlehund. They were water retrievers. Uh, then the French turned them into beauty objects. But um, that was King Louis the Fifteenth. That's coming. That's coming in the history uh, timeline. But suffice it to say that, you know, your haircut dogs by this point in time, if by the time you get to the Roman Empire, if they're getting, uh, if they're used, being used for water retrieving or any other working function, they're going to get matted. And so they would cut them, um, but they would cut them leaving hair on the vital organs and the joints. The joints mm -hmm. would need to be kept warm and they would not shave them at their elbows, their ankles, around their chest where their vital organs were, around the top of their head where their head had to be kept warm. So anywhere around their chest, their head, the tip of their tail, their elbows, their ankles, uh, they would cut, they would cut everything else. And that's the origins of the early continental cut. Um, it was designed to protect vital organs. Now today it's much more stylized, obviously. Um, Which started so, getting stylized really early. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as soon as we, yeah. and, and like when you look at the paint, I mean, it really was uh, King Louis the 15th, and I'm jumping way ahead, that really turned uh, that turned this into an art form uh, and had the first grooming salons. And we'll get to that in a second. But I just wanted to say this about the Middle Ages. During the Middle Ages, um, somewhere around 1000 AD, like a 1000 years after Jesus, after, where the calendar changed, um, you have these serfdoms and these kingdoms. You have early laws, interesting, that you actually see in ancient, uh, in, in uh, medieval European uh, literature, that there were rules about who could own dogs because only the noble lord would be allowed to own hunting dogs because that was the key to controlling the food supply and getting people mm. to work for you and controlling your piece of real estate. So owning Scottish deer hounds and Irish wolfhounds and things like that, that were hunting dogs, uh, retrieving dogs, those were really valuable and they were controlled all by the noble lord or surf um, guys and uh, that the, had you know, control of their little communities and uh, some lord, some noble lord. They well, would hunting keep... wasn't allowed without permission. So why right, would you even right. need a hunting dog? Um, you were, uh, it was all under the control of the, the landlord, the, the noble lord guy. And he would have serfs and vassals, people working his fields and people, you know, uh, you know, milking his cattle. And he had um, kennel boys. This is actually in medieval literature. Kennel boys that Wait. would actually care for the, the for noble the dog. lord's dogs, hunting dogs. And we know from pictures that these uh, early kennel boys um, had whose phones ring? It's not mine. Not mine. Oh, it's my landline. Okay. All right. I can't believe it's picking not it. up, but yeah, <laughs> not landline. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, yeah, who uses landline? I'm, I'm about, my husband and I are about ready to get rid of our landlines. We're at that advanced of a stage. So, um, this is one of the um, uh, most early um, 
most early records of actual groomers, people showing people grooming. It's in a book dated about 1389 or 1390 um, AD uh, or CE, common era. So this is uh, about 1400 years um, after Jesus lived. And um, we show uh, in a noble Lord's estate where he has a castle and then he has vassals and merchants and servants and workers living around him. And he has control of a kennel full of hunting dogs. And in that hunting dog's kennel, we have, we have evidence of early combs and brushes. And something that might be like a knife scissor kind of a thing, uh, or maybe a shedding tool or a rake type of thing. And there is actually a um, La Livre de Chasse in French, uh, written by Gaston Phoebus, um, and who was a noble, a nobleman. Uh, it was in French, the, the book of the hunt, La Livre de Chasse, the, the chasse or the chase. So this is the book of the hunt, and this told the how-to of how to hunt, how to sharpen your bows and arrows, how to build your weapons and so on. But it also shows uh, diagrams of these kennel boys walking the dogs in front of the noble lord's horse and grooming them. There's an actual uh, diagram in there of their brushing their teeth, uh, doing something to the pads of their feet, like clipping their toenails or filing their to toenails, more likely. Um, actually examining their teeth, bathing them. They have this little bucket of water and they're scooping the water on them and bathing them. And this is a Book this is a book, or... but it's got diagrams in it. And so it's mostly, a, have a... it's called La Livre de Chasse, or the Book of oh, the boy. Hunt, by Gaston Phoebus, dated around 1390 oh. AD. Oh, and goodness. that book has actual diagrams of people grooming dogs. So that's mm -hmm. officially yeah. the first real hardcore evidence of people actually combs, brushes, bathing, nails, you know, that kind of stuff. It's really cool. Um, all Did right. I, do any hair I cutting? found the link. Yeah, of course. It's do they have there. evidence of hair cutting and stuff? Was there like styling at that era? Or not is this more that, of a, not in that book. the husbandry stuff that you would do like like general care? Like you would care for your sheep, you would care for your horses, you would care for your dogs. Yeah, it was more general husbandry how in the picture okay. that is in yeah. there. But interestingly, but it there. looks like the dogs actually have some, some hair. Mm. It actually looks like there is a little bit of fringing on them. And uh, it's clear that, that, that it's out of their eyes. So I'm assuming, and I know that they mm. had in that, you know, by that time period, they had not necessarily, again, scissors, but that squeezy tool that the Roman yep. Empire had. Um, mm -hmm. that you would, it's the same kind of thing that like you would cut the top of a hedge with, and, and they still use them to shear sheep with. Sometimes. I was going to say, I might have a pair downstairs. Yeah. Not the dog grooming, but they're yeah. historical. So, <laughs> so it, anyway, so yeah. this is really an exciting thing to know that people were grooming. And, and, and more interesting to me is that this was a profession. These kennel mm -hmm. boys were, and they were all young men. They lived on the estate and they cared for the noble lord's dogs. Can I ask, just going back to the um, the other book, I don't have yeah, it. Yeah, the Lost hands, Through but, the Canine Race, this one? Yes. In that one, they referred to, in, in some, I don't remember when, but in there they called them dog boys? Yeah, it's the same thing. Does that kennel sound boys, familiar? Kennel boys, dog boys, same thing. Yeah. Dog boys. Okay. Yeah. I was just wondering. I think it was about the same time, but yeah, that medieval was Medieval period my... and not good record keeping, of course, in those days. Um, and really, but but a named profession. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That had, yeah. interestingly, some laws written around it in terms of who got control of these dogs and that they were to be cared for only by these people and they would only belong to certain people. So it was a somewhat regulated, identifiable profession, you know, almost what, uh, almost a thousand years ago. I mean, it's pretty. Pretty amazing. Well, and hunting dogs were um, not only owned by the wealthy, but a display of wealth. So you would want them well cared for yes, and much like any it. other staff on a large estate as part of your display of wealth, you would want the best of the best for your hunting dogs, as well as the staff that would take care of them. 
know? it's so true. Mm -hmm. And then exactly yeah. your point, Chrissy, about um, as um, civilization pro progresses towards the Renaissance now and out of the Dark Ages, more and more education and more civilization, people, population starts to grow, people start living in cities, these serfdoms around the castle become villages and cities, and um, more and more people are living in them. And by the time that you start having smaller homes, then you start to see the toy-sized dogs appear that are strictly, um, you know, to fit in smaller homes and in cities where people are living closer together in smaller spaces. And that's when you just start to see the artwork appearing of the noble ladies, the wealthy ladies, having a small hairy dog sitting on their lap. I don't have any uh, evidence yet of haircuts until we get to the 15th century and the Elizabethan era of actual pictures of anybody doing any haircutting, but you can see little hairy dogs sitting on the lady with all the fancy dress and jewelry, um, you know, again, going back, um, you know, to the beginning of the Renaissance, you know, uh, almost, um, you know, 800 years ago. So um, then the next, I'm just gonna kind of skip ahead to sort of key, key developments. Um, the, the next thing that you, um, that you really see um, is the development of the terrier because of the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague um, sweeps um, certainly Europe and m much of the, the world. We don't really have good records from Africa and China. Scientists are speculating that the bubonic plague was global, just like our pandemic is. And that the bubonic plague was deadly to the point of killing one out of every four living people on the planet over a 300 year period of time, huge. Um, it lasted for 300 years. Please God, I hope our pandemic does not last 300 years, yes. but 300 years and they developed the terrier. They may have already had little dogs, but they began to realize that they could be ratters and that they could go after these vermin that were carrying the plague. It was actually the fleas on the rats and mice that were carrying the plague, but they were the carriers of the plague. And the more that they could breed these aggressive little dogs that would do go to ground after vermin, that was really a big deal. And again, so we're starting to see in the art of the time that there's these wiry coated, skirted, bearded breeds. They developed them with that wiry hair because they had to go with their faces in the ground after things with teeth coming at them. And so I have a so, question for you. Yeah. Um, because I've always heard the theory that um, the the little terrier type dogs were because not so much to um, keep the rodents down for disease control, but because the rodents were getting into the wheat. They were getting into your crops and in your storage supply, for food. All of and the that they didn't really make a connection that like rats were not healthy, you know, that like, but, but that, and I've also heard some theories that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's the, probably the job, true. We don't know for the sure. Job is connected to the code almost like when they when we were talking about the foxes that have been bred for tameness their coat changed with that you know right. that that's a secondary thing mm -hmm. that they weren't even necessarily thinking about like oh a more rugged coat as much as like well that one's really good with rats you know <laughs> right <laughs> and they're actually the, the we don't we don't see any evidence of humans directing the dogs to get a wiry coat with a specific okay. adapted yeah. to a specific terrain until about the 1800s so okay. that's way yeah. you know another three or four hundred years I later so. i thought it was more of a Reading for a job and a coat type came and with a it. terrain came with and it a and terrain. And, um, yeah, okay. All but two of the terrier breeds were created in the British Isles, and mm -hmm. they were specific to a kind of terrain, mm -hmm. uh, whether it was more field or more rocky or more you know rivery or whatever. Constant rain. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, so that's another coat that we're seeing developed, and of course, um, I'm you know it's very common sense, although I don't see any physical record of it, that they just pulled their hair out because they've, you know, it got bigger and stronger hairs and they had to just pull it out. But we don't know that for sure. Mm. There is um, at petgroomer.com, there's a, a little history where they think that what they put up there on the petgroomer.com forward slash. You want me to share this? I don't know what exactly the part of the website mm. was that said, just Googling groomer history. Yeah. 
Um, but they said that this picture from Elizabethan England in the 15th century, where it actually shows in a marketplace, a woman's got a dog on her lap and she's taken its hair off. It's not a very clear painting, but you can see it. And there is evidence uh, in a marketplace of a woman giving a dog a haircut on her lap um, that is uh, about 500 years old. Okay. They have um, they have just an insert from uh, a lithograph, as I recall, of a marketplace. The lost history of the canine race. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I remember um, so seeing that I'll, one. I'll put this, I'll put this so the one. more recent that we get, obviously, the better the data gets, the better the evidence gets, the better the you know physical records are. So the really um, first actually documented um, professional you know groomers that are women and that are in salons is the French. So when Louis the Fifteenth, King of France when he uh, imported the poodle because he liked it, and moreover, his wife liked it, um, they took this German water retrieving poodlehund, brought it to France and turned it into this work of art because they loved what its hair could do. And they opened the first salons. This is actually in the court of King Louis the XV. Uh, you actually see um, in, this, in the 17th century, you actually see uh, the word salon and the name of grooming, uh, the name of the groomer profession here, instead of being kennel boys, that's from, from the medieval period. Now we have demoiselles, D-E-S, yes. demoiselles. And so this is 17th century France. Oh, well, let's we switch have, to that. Yes. <laughs> like <it. laughs> so demoiselles clearly Does that mean we women. can charge more? You bet you could. <laughs> And obviously in service of the upper class, always. It sounds this is like a, 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 it sounds like a, is it a poor So demo? a demoiselle <laughs> would be the first evidence of women in the job, uh, as opposed to the kennel boys of the Middle Ages. And, um, and the demoiselles were serving the upper class and they were doing scissor cuts with primitive scissors, you know, seven, you know, 300 year old scissors. Um, I mean, I look at scissors from the 1950s and I think I could never groom with those. They're awful looking. All right. There is actually a shop in West Virginia called Demoiselle's Pet Parent. There you go. Like, awesome. A nod to our history. Yes. Yep. And they have a lot of stuff. I'm just looking it up and, and they, they have a. I think we should change together. the profession name. I like it. Demoiselles. I know. Demoiselles. Right. Demoiselles. Demoiselle. Except it's all of the grooming. wonderful men that are in the profession. They're probably not going to. No, they probably won't like that. But in any case, that's the first time that we see actual historical proof of grooming salons. Places of business that people would take their pets to to get groomed. Um, and again, hundreds of years old, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so, you know, we can, you know, we can kind of get into the weeds about actually what happens to me that, that's significant over the next few hundred years. And now there's a lot more information that starts happening just since, you know, the King Louis the 15th of France, um, is that, you, you know, you start to see a lot more dogs getting haircuts all a lot more all over I'm, the world. I'm just going to jump in yeah. because I just Googled demoiselles and in French, it actually means a professional unmarried girl or young woman. So these were obviously working girls. Working right. girls. Yeah. Right. So it, Career and, women. and it says, what is the difference between a mademoiselle a and demoiselle. a... Demoiselle. Oh, mm -hmm. um, a, a demoiselle is a noble title. Right. And these it's, were definitely ladies. And Mademoiselle of the court. is mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. lady of the night. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, 
in any case, it was um, it was really the French that turned um, grooming into art artistry. I mean, obviously, we saw that on the Roman coin that they were doing fancy cuts on a, a poodle type coat of, of sorts. Maybe not a poodle, but maybe it's you know just hair a haircut of some sort. Um, so, but what I think is really the next most significant thing is that you have um, a an explosion of breeds developing. There is actual um, scientific evidence that there's five genetics lines of dogs. Uh, if you go back tens of thousands of years, uh, evolutionarily around the planet, they have proved through DNA that there has been five independent genetic lines from the New Guinea, you know, Pacific Island area and from North America and from South America, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, in these very separate geographic areas, all of them developing their own dog lines um and which is is so it was truly a global phenomenon in every in every culture um but by the time that, but by the time that you get to maybe the last 300 years just since our time about 300 years ago um so barely like the age of the united states um you have maybe 29 uh, people have identified through the genetics and they're guessing but it's looking at the genetic record and the archaeological record. They're guessing maybe about 29 breeds of dogs by the, by the last 300 years. And then you go to mid-1850s, so just like, you know, 150, 180 years ago. Um, and you just go back a little bit and you see an explosion of breeds, especially in Europe, especially in England, hunting around the development of the gun. As soon as the gun is developed and then the hunting advances and it becomes, you know, much more, you're able to go after birds and ducks and different things that you couldn't really capture before. So um, there was a whole explosion of breeding and what was maybe 29 or 30 breeds of dogs becomes what is now globally recognized. Here we are in 2022. The FCI, which is the Fédération Cynologique Internationale, it's the International Kennel Club tracker of dog genetics. They have genetic, genetically identified uh, 390 separate breeds of dogs that are genetically unique and clearly breed specific. So we have had in just the last 150 years, um, you know, like, going from 30 breeds to almost 400. That's huge. That's a huge mm -hmm. explosion of breeding that has happened just in the last couple hundred years. So I, I'm assuming, and again, there's a lot, there's a probably a really great research paper to be written on this, that you know, we now know, uh, of course, we see uh, this in Chinese carvings from, you know, and Japanese uh, carvings and things from just the last 200 years or so, that grooming is global by this, by this last couple hundred years, that breeding um, is becoming very specific to functions, certain types of hunting, certain types of climate, um, the sight hounds uh, in, you know, Northern Africa and so on. So it's, there's some really exciting things that develop, but really um, they don't even have electricity until the late 1800s, right? And my favorite dog grooming history picture is actually one from just around the 1950s. So after World War II, just before I was born, women, a picture of a woman I show in the, uh, show this in my gro grooming um, history photos, uh, women sitting on a shelf they're wearing a skirt and stockings hosiery and high heels and a i old, got it right, right? Here. yeah you and seen this picture they're sitting up on a counter holding dogs and they've got heat lamps over their head and fans so that was their blow dryer they had a heat lamp and a fan okay there mm -hmm. it is there's the picture and um, and they're using heat lamps and fans as mm -hmm. the way. And this is just right before I was born, okay? And they had to wear skirts and hosiery to work. And I wouldn't want to groom like that. And I've seen their scissors. The scissors were very, you know, not, they just- Craft scissors. 
Yeah, yeah. they weren't great. They, kind of sewing scissors. Yeah. For one thing, the joint on all of their scissors was perfectly in the in the middle. How do I do this? Mm -hmm. I can't. My fingers are backwards. Okay. So the joint, instead of being, you know, like lower down so that we get more of an open for less, you know, we like the scissors where the where the joint of it is closer to our thumbs, right? Because yeah, that shorter, would tang. Us, yeah, we, shorter move here, shorter mm -hmm. tang move here, but gives a bigger open shot at the top. But their scissors were back in the 1950s the ones I've seen where the joint was in the middle. So they were opening and closing way wide to get a cut. And they were I'm trying to find a picture, not fancy. Um, so we've come a long way. Um, I don't know when the first, uh, I, I know that they were using, uh, remember, we don't have electricity until the 1800s, and that was primarily for light. Um, by the 20th century, we have pretty much widespread electricity. And I know that they had uh, sheer, uh, uh, they developed the blade on a clipper that would go back and forth with a little motor button that would push the, the blade back and forth. They used it in farms to shear sheep with, and I know that they used it with dogs. Um, oh my so God. we have 20th century Wait. clippers. Do you? You have any pictures? Found I got, something. I I got some. Good, go. No, no, no. There we go. So, okay, this is. Oh, that's that one. Hold on, sorry. I got a fascinate. Here it is. Okay, I. It's hard. I've got so many tabs open right now. <laughs> it's cool stuff. I love mm. this. It's really neat. Okay, it's the nineteen fascinate. Okay, it's that one. But like, you know, like all things that grow very slowly over time, over history. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Is that a clipper or is that clippers? a dryer? It's a clipper. That's hmm. a clipper. So big, mo big motor. Big clipper. Yeah. And it's got the. So you've got the, the part, the handle the part end. that's got the, the head going back and forth, back and forth. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's powered by a big motor sitting on top of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can is it still sharing? Yeah. yeah. Look at that. Yeah. He's with his cigarette. Yes. I know, right? yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm going to share this link because it's an entire link of. Um, tell me, I didn't realize it was allowing me to go through all of. Yeah. Of these. Here's the scissors. They're just how long but... they're holding mm -hmm. the dogs, lifting the legs way, way up high. That's not good. Um, and it looks like a poodly type dog. Yeah. And notice that they're not wearing grooming smocks of any kind. Well, there's an apron on that lady. She's, she's an got an apron. Yeah. 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 That looks like a Celium Terrier to me. It That's does. What I was, I was wondering just too. thinking that. Yeah, because yep. he's got a fall and he's got the short ears and he's got the beard and he's short legged and long bodied. That looks like a Celium Terrier to me. So, and what are the, what's the date on those pictures? Sarah. 1951. Cool. Mm -hmm. So that's just, you know, six years before I was born. So mm -hmm. I was born in 57. Coats. Here's an Airedale. Look at that. Mm -hmm. And and jackets were, were priority. I remember there, when I was so. a kid, they put the Scottish, they put the plaid jackets on Scotties all the time. It was a big thing. <laughs> Over 50% of the dogs in the UK will receive Christmas stockings in 1951. That's great. So we're really seeing them being suddenly a part of our homes and families. Um, yeah. And just remember, we've made some history of our own here recently because dog ownership globally, not just in the U.S., has gone up a minimum of at least 25%. There are literally, and it depends on whose numbers you believe, but I've been tracking the people that are studying it, 25 to 29% more dogs living in the USA in the first year of the pandemic. That was a huge population explosion of dogs during the early pandemic because breeders saw the opportunity, people were at home, they wanted to all buy dogs all of a sudden. And um, it, it happened not just here, but globally. So actually we've had a very historic recent series of developments. But when you see what the clipper used to look like, what scissors used to look like, how we used to have to dress, um, even just in what would be the equivalent of 
my lifetime or I mean, I turned 65 this year. So, you know, but you think about some of the great grooming people um, that have been around since way before, you know, before me. And um, you've got, you've, you've still got some great history there. There are people that remember a time when clippers looked like a big motor sitting on top of a thing that went like this, you know. It's, it's pretty amazing how far we've come and, and something to feel really, really good about. Now, um, I think... How about the... Do you remember the Disney movie, The Ugly Dachshund? The Ugly Dachshund. I remember Lady... No, I don't remember that. I don't the think. Ugly Dachshund in 1966. And, of course, Lassie, you're a Dachshund person. So you tell us. Uh, it, it is... I know. We have... We, we loved this movie. It was... Absolutely adorable. Um, and is there grooming in it? It's so the point of the movie is a married couple. Um, his wife shows dachshunds and he decided he wanted his own dog and got a puppy, Great Dane. <laughs> and the puppy Great Dane was raised with the puppy Dachshunds and does not realize he is a 120 pound dog versus a 20 pound dog of the Dachshunds. And was it, this a cartoon? Just, it's, no, it's a movie. Um, <laughs> Dean Jones, uh, Mark Garrett. Oh, I'll have to okay, go see that. Was, yeah, I do I'm think to... um, and most people will remember Lady and the Tramp, which is a cocker spaniel and a mutt, mm -hmm. right? And that yeah. movie, while it didn't get specifically into grooming all that much, uh, there is sort of sideways. You'll see, you know, dogs of basically all dogs at, in that movie. And that movie came out when I was a child. And so I'm going to say it's in the early 60s, maybe. I'm not sure what the date is for Lady and the Tramp. But in any case, clearly all dogs in that Disney cartoon movie about dogs fell into two categories. There were the groomed and well cared for purebred dogs that lived in nice houses and belonged to, to families of some means. And then there was the mutts wandering the streets. And that was pretty much the dichotomy of the world of dogs by the early 1960s. And um, clearly, you know, Lady came back from the groomer and she was, you don't see her being groomed, but you see her coming back from the groomer, all, you know, combed and brushed perfectly with little bows in her hair. Um, you know, so already the idea of grooming for status and um, purebred dogs being a, an example of, of well cared for elite dogs, it's always been a driver of dogs and grooming that status was associated with it. It's the same, you know this, Dara, from horses, right? This is driven yeah, the absolutely. horse um, world. This, yep. It's about status and it's associated yep. with wealth and people would emulate it. A, a dog was a great way, even going back, you know, to the Middle Ages where we talked about life in medieval Europe. If the noble people had dogs, um, and the, the, the rich ladies had little fluffy things sitting on their laps in the paintings, then to own a dog was a way of um, being, you know, like people. It's like conspicuous consumption. I'm going to have a dog too because they have one and they're rich. So it's... Yeah. Um, We're so well off. We can waste food on a pet yeah. that has no purpose. You know, yes. <laughs> Except to love us, which love you know, us. we I now mean, know we is purpose, very but not a job, you know. So yeah, but, um thinking about like the 50s and stuff, but there's it often comes up with that episode of the Dick Van Dyke show that goes into oh, yeah. there's an episode that goes into like yep. how much they were charging for a poodle back then. And it kind of bugs me because groomers always talk about like that's what I'm charging now. Except the poodle back then was an entire day's work. Oh yes. They didn't have like good blood dryers. High velocity dryers. It was an no entire high velocity day for, Yeah, you no. know, like that. It was not something you could do in two and a half hours or something. Mm -hmm. You know, like that. But um, but yeah, I know that. I don't know if you guys, uh, Chrissy, you're too young. But and oh, Dara, sorry, sorry, sorry. Dara, I think on. you're younger than I am too. But <laughs> I remember I'm as older a child. Than Dara. <laughs> I, I remember as a child what my handheld hair dryer that my mom would dry my hair with in the 1960s, what that looked like. And it was 
loud and it smelled bad. It was uh, heavy. It was, it had the funnel and the round motor and the mm -hmm. handle. So it looked kind of like a pistol with a fan in the middle of it mm -hmm. um, plugged in and it would smell bad. It would use up a lot of electricity. Sometimes it would flip the breakers and my dad would have to go and replace those little fuses. And have the fabric cord. I mean, we're talking about the 1960s here that my father had to go every time my mom would blow dry our hair he would have to go put new little fuses into the breaker box and they, and it would smell bad. And those dryers Eventually you just put in a penny. Ah. <laughs> so blow dryers, the, the, that's why the advancement the invention of the high velocity dryer about which I wrote an article for groomer to groomer, I think a year or so ago, you can go to groomer to groomer.com and look me up as a columnist. And you will see uh, like about a year ago, I wrote a thing on the, what is the origins of the invention of the high velocity dryer that started because of pigs and goats. I don't know if you know that story, but um, no. the people that developed, you know, the, the, the speedy um, mm -hmm. people, um, they actually had leaf blowers uh, that they were, uh, that they had developed too. And they um, found at uh, county fairs that pig and sheep, people showing their pigs and sheep at county fairs were using their leaf blowers because they were powerful on their on their goats and their sheep. Oh, and wow. so, I had a customer wow. actually do that on their Samoyed. A, a leaf back blower. Back in the 90s. Yeah. A leaf blower. And that was yep. what that made that company say, hmm, this could work on dogs. And they developed yeah, a I, high velocity. I do remember grooming before we got a, a high velocity dryer. And using a Oster stand dryer to dry a German shepherd was it's tedious. Hard. <laughs> hard. Hard. Yeah. yeah. Tedious. Yeah. We're so spoiled. We now. are, but sometimes I know we're spoiled, you know, but if you yeah. think about how we come, just, I mean, it's so much fun, just in my lifetime, you know, um, we didn't have cordless clippers no. until I was, until well into the 80s or you know almost, and they were insanely expensive so i don't think we really had affordable cord cordless you had the 90s. were there i, I was going to say i don't remember the cordless coming out until the early 2000s oh really no, that's possible i had this cordless clipper in 98 ish okay so I I it. It. i'm thinking about which job i was at yeah okay yeah I think well i, I posted downstairs. i posted the dick van dyke oh cool <laughs> show and i like that show it says, watch it anyway <laughs> i know it says the That's ugly classic. dachshund is on netflix right now right. for anyone interested. oh cool and i would just encourage yeah. everybody as a we... demko oh bobby's mm. right a demko was the first mm. of everything mm. the they demko... came out with all the start yeah and then now they're out of business well and also <laughs> there was um Oh, who else was making dryers that's not around? Anyway, I, I this is in my article about the, the I'm just talking about the high velocity that was, mm -hmm. that was called. but um, I do think when you think about people like me that are, you know, still around grooming, um, you begin to realize that almost everything that's the amazing artistry that we can do now because we have thinning shears and we have curved scissors and we have things that are ergonomically Chunkers. healthy with swivel thumbs and we have high velocity Chunkers sizes. I know not everything's just eight inches. Yeah. <laughs> Six inches or eight inches. Those are your and choices. We can do so much more because we can do eight dogs in a day because we have more powerful dryers and safer, safer equipment. And we used to have dogs die so much because they would be put under heat cage dryers and that was awful. Well, we and we were using flea products like crazy. A lot of problems with that. We used to do hot oil treatments in the 80s, my friends. Oh, and yeah. the, and the hot oil and treatments those. were horrible for dogs. Horrible. Yeah. They were so thick. It was, poor, you know, thinking that that was really soothing for their, but they were using heavy, mm -hmm. heavy oil. And dogs mm -hmm. would actually end up with, you know, clogged follicle pore, major health issues. Um, yeah. What were some of the other stupid, the coal tar uh, shampoos. Remember, pe people used to yep. think coal tar shampoos were really therapeutic. Yep. That was actually flea and tick toxic. dips. Dips, flea and tick dips. Yeah, flea and tick dips. Dip. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, poison. Yeah, yeah. really, really yeah. dangerous. Yeah, yeah. 
So I mean, so many things that are way. different, you know, um, tubs that are designed for dog grooming, you know, <laughs> instead of human bath. Oh, when I instead started human grooming, bath tubs that are made, everything was a human bath up above the legs. An old claw foot tub that you could walk yep. around three sides and. Yeah, we used to just take old human bathtubs and put them up on wooden legs, build a wooden frame to support mm -hmm. them up. I mean, that was what everybody was using in the 80s when I was first grooming. Mm. Yeah. And then you store your shampoo under it. Yeah. In that exactly. weird cesspool of moisture. Daryl's <laughs> 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 yeah. terrible idea. Gross it's faces. Terrible idea. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. It makes so you realize amazing. how far we've come. It's so amazing. Well, and I know we're nearing the end, but I yeah. don't know if we want to mention to like maybe next time or something, but um, with the internet and the beginnings of those online groomer communities, oh, wow, Dude. that sparked so much Changed change. Everything. Yeah. Changed everything. Yeah. The everything. isolation the groomer's lounge. Used to be in. Oh my God, the amount of time yeah. I spent on the groomer's lounge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yes, I think, you know, next episode, we should definitely talk about just what's happened in our lifetimes. It's it's pretty amazing how far we've come, how fast. So. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Dara's like, yeah, whatever. I, <laughs> She's like, oh, I know. No. I'm just, no, 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 not at all. I just, I'm going back. I keep thinking, Lee's going to go, oh, let's go watch the ugliest dachshund now. <laughs> I, Dara, you need to find out when was the first grooming school? Oh my goodness. I well, I don't know. Well, I'm that'll like, be your homework for next week. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, let's yeah. find out that. Yeah. That would be I know there cool. were there were a couple local up here in New England that were that were I believe from no, the I don't know which one's older, the New York School or the Nash Academy. Um, I know that Nash Sam Cole Nash had a very early 70s. one, I think, one of the first, um, and mm -hmm. wrote one of the first books, one of the first yeah. great grooming guides. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, that's a research thing. Yeah, <laughs> that is definitely. Maybe our listeners thing. who are so savvy will know too. <laughs> Yeah, maybe somebody Sorry. will know. Watchers. I, mean, I went it's a live to stream. I'm used to podcasts. I'm thinking listeners, watchers, <laughs> viewers, watchers, watchers. Viewers. Some people might be listening because they're driving That's or true. doing something right. else. So, but yeah. But the history is All interesting. Right, so we're gonna. It really mm -hmm. is, and if you don't have the book, the lost history, history of the canine race, canine. Yes, lost <laughs> history. It is one. Somebody should read it yeah. on Audible so that it can be read. Ooh. Because I know a lot of groomers don't really like to read. So this they might listen to that. Christy, maybe it's another podcast. And there's not a lot of <laughs> there's not a lot about grooming in it, You've but there the is a lot it. about how important the dog is to us, which is yes. which yeah. is really cool. which is important. Yeah. I mean, that's our livelihood. So yeah. but it does make you feel not, good about what we do for a living. I think all of this really reaffirms that, you know, if you look at how long humans and um, dogs have been, I mean, there's all sorts of evidence that dogs may be actually responsible for our very survival. And I've talked about that in some of my, there's actual scientific evidence. That's another conversation. But, um, you know, there is actual evidence going way back that, in fact, they may be directly responsible for our survival and at several critical junctures in our history. But if you think about that, we are the horses, too. It's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Horses also. I'm going to throw that out there. That's true. Know, the horse, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. They go, and the horse and the dog go hand, hand in hand. hand. Mm -hmm. um, I will say this is kind of, it's a little off topic, but... I started um, a book called Sacagawea, and it's like Ooh. monstrous. Yeah. And Sacagawea one, is one of my favorite characters Sacagawea, in history. Yeah. yeah, and I just read one of the chapters in just it. Just for folks that don't um, know, she's the Native American woman who guided Lewis and Clark to explore the American West. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so she's just very young and just taken from, she was just held captive from her original tribe as a Shoshone. 
and um, when she was, she befriended the dogs in her camp were part of the camp. The dogs in the camp she was taken as a slave into were not. And a wild dog befriended her. Um, and the way the camp um, dismissed her and how they felt about her. And as a child, I mean, mm -hmm. this was before she was, and I say a child, she was probably eight. Yeah, well, um, mm -hmm. Because she was like, 12 when she got in with the Lewis and Clark. So very, very young. Um, but it was a fascinating chapter with the dog involved in it and how it rescued her and how it saved her and kept the uh, men of the tribe away from her. Mm, cool. That's cool. So, and I love Bobby Bauer. She said, when I, when I was a kid, I used to use my shop vac on reverse as a blow dryer. That's I did that too. <laughs> In the 80s, <laughs> in the early 80s, we'd take our shop back and just turn him into a blower. Yeah, because mm. it was better than any and of the Ashley, lines. Ashley does have a lot to read. I believe she's in your course, isn't she? Yeah. Chrissy? Yeah, she's in my course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she loves to read. She asked me already, like, what's what are the books in all four levels? I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same. I, give me a book. And Lisa, I was like, are you serious? That's like over a thousand pages ages i'm like yep yeah. <laughs> i'm yeah. enthralled with well, it. <laughs> and while i'm not a, a a history teacher i mean my thing is middle ages reenactment stuff living history and you know i yeah. easily spend a week out in the woods just like you know and you know that they had wood. forged metal <laughs> you know and they yeah. had forged metal yeah. and they they were they definitely cutting hair they were cutting they human had precision hair. tools we had precision yes. tools yeah. for mm -hmm. ages yeah yeah you know yeah yeah. Um, yeah and um in parallel to what we know about the kind of things they were doing with horses and with sheep i mean it makes sense that someone was grooming dogs too you know yeah. we just need to find more evidence of it and before there were actual like wide amounts of society reading, a lot of these things are things that we're finding in artwork. Yes. Oh, uh, absolutely. Know? Yeah. Um, sometimes the they're in the margins illiterate. of manuscripts. Yeah. Like pictures in the margins for no reason at all. Um, Other than the know, people illustrations, read. Um, yeah. tapestries, but just trying to find evidence of, well, someone was doing it because we had all the tools and it makes sense that like, if your dog was totally tangled up, you'd be like, how's he going to pull the net in with us? You know, and that you would do it, but where would we find him? And someone's going to find it. I think that Every there's time pretty think good we evidence know, we that, that we don't really see a lot of haircut type dogs in, in art until after the Renaissance. And yep. really even then, pretty much more a self-care coat, more like a, you know, retriever type coat. So it mm -hmm. is, um, it's, you don't really see the real floofy floofies until recently, because obviously the breeding is going to follow the technology, right? If there's not yeah. a technology yeah. to do the grooming easily, it's not, mm -hmm. I mean, the doodle never would have become a thing, um, you know, a hundred years ago because they yeah. wouldn't have had the technology yeah. to deal with them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> interesting yeah history is neat history is so much fun totally. I, it was always my favorite class in school i just can't memorize dates and places and names i, I man time. concepts yeah. yes dates and places god that's tough that's anybody yeah. who thinks that teaching that that if, if you had a history important. teacher who made you learn dates as as the way you studied history you had a bad teacher because it's oh, not no, about dates it's more about <laughs> yeah. how this influences this and in, this influences this and these things come together to go this direction you have to think bigger picture and you get the mm -hmm. then you get the yep. real meaning of it yeah yeah yep. and that these were people just like us well, living in a different technology yeah just like us yes not as literate all right as ashley says y'all know i'm an overachiever yeah we know ashley yeah we, we know ashley we know ashley's putting us we all know. thank you okay ashley and everybody else <laughs> yes 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 thank goodness all right ladies we are good so we will pick up next, next week. week and now we know we're gonna get you yeah, I have to wait live. to log in so until you go live. 
Yeah. Pan it. We'll get you in there. We'll figure this out. And um, I'm going to get on. I, I wrote a note to get on Streamline. Stream. No. Restream. 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 Thank you. To see what's going on with it. So I'll I'll reach out to them, Jennifer. Oh, this worked out though tonight. I'm so glad. It sure did. Ahead. All right. So I am going to go to our closing credits and we'll see you guys next week. Bye, everybody.